reading from the book of Sirach. God sets a father in honor of his children. A mother's authority he confirms over her sons. Whoever honors his father atones for sins and preserves himself from them. When he pray, he is heard. He stores up riches who reveres his mother. Whoever honors his father is gladdened by children and when he Praise is heard. Whoever reveres his father will live a long life. Who obeys his father brings comfort to his mother. My son, take care of your father when he is old. Grieve him not as long as he lives, even if his mind <coughs> fail. Be considerate of him. Revile him not all the days of his life. Kindness to a father will not be forgotten, firmly planted against the death of your sins, a house raised in justice to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. Brothers and sisters, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, you so must you also do. And over all these put on love, that is, the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts, the peace into which you were also called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, be subordinate to your husbands as a proper in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and avoid any bitterness toward them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, as they may not be discouraged. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. to the Lord, and to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, in accordance with the dictate and the law of the Lord. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, awaiting the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Christ of the Lord. He came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform the custom of the law in regard to him, he took him into his arms and blessed God, saying, Now, Master, you may let your servant go in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in sight of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory for your people, Israel. Child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be contradicted. And you yourself, a sword will pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived seven years with her husband after her marriage, and then as a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day with fasting and prayer. And coming forward at that very time, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had fulfilled all the prescriptions of the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong. 
filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The Gospel of the Lord. As vocation director, my duties for my job is to help people discern their vocation, their call in this life. And of course, there's two ways of looking at vocation. We can say a lowercase v vocation and a uppercase v. Lowercase v vocation are those senses of callings of the Lord to maybe do something within our life um, that's kind of a side thing, but is given completely to the Lord. So, for example, uh, just not too long ago, somebody was telling me that they have a vocation to uh, make rosaries and, and send those rosaries out. So what they mean by that is they have this call from the Lord, they feel, that they are meant to share their gifts in this way. Or a person might, you know, a vocation to, to bring music to the, to the worship. Different gifts brought. So this is a, a lowercase v vocation. And then the uppercase v vocation is those states of life that are uh, committed to the Lord in some way. So the church recognizes primarily four of these, the priesthood, the religious life, the married life, and then dedicated single life, where a single person says, I'm going to remain single so that I might be free uh, to serve the Lord or serve the community in some form or, or fashion. And there's some kind of commitment to that. So today we're going to look at uh, the vocation of marriage and family, since this is the feast of the Holy Family. But also because I have I have found that when I'm uh, working with young men who are discerning the call to the, the priesthood, which of course is the main vocation that I'm working with, helping young men determine that, most of them have a very good sense that the vocation to the priesthood is a call and that they're going to respond to this call from the Lord and that's going to be a way that they serve him in mission for the rest of their life. But the couples that I do preparation for marriage for, often that's kind of foreign to them. To them, often it's just they fell in love with this person and, and they want to spend their life with them and they don't recognize the deeper calling that is there, that the Lord has called them to a mission to a vocation, a calling, to serve him, to build up a family to his glory. And so that's what we're going to look at is, is this vocation of, of married life. And this sheet that you have before you, uh, the readings for this weekend, are just a great sheet to go through to keep kind of deepening our sense of our vocation of family life. Uh, Sirach sets before us his great advice about the family and about the elderly. Uh, the psalm you know, praises the, the husband and the wife of the fruitful vine. The Colossians goes through the ways that we have these different roles within it. And then finally, the gospel gives us the image of the holy family. But because there are so many scripture passages, I'm going to narrow down to just one. And it will be the most controversial of them. Because I figure since I'm the visiting priest, it's best to do the most controversial. Because I'll be gone and you won't be able to complain. <laughs> so... What we're going to do is go to the bottom of Colossians, to that section, Wives, be subordinate to your husbands, as is proper in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and avoid any bitterness toward them. So first, why is this such a controversial passage in our time? Uh, mainly because we've kind of gone over the last number of decades from one extreme to the other, uh, and a certain understanding of the roles of man and woman, or husband and wife. So we could say in a number of communities a number of decades ago, we would say what held sway was machismo. The idea that the man had that he is superior to the woman, and therefore he makes all the decisions, uh, he understands things better, that, that men, by just the fact that they are men, are better than, than women in some way. But then now we've kind of swung to the opposite extreme, which you might call egalitarianism, applied to married life. And that is where it's no longer simply the Christian teaching that husband and wife are equal in dignity. But now it's being said that, well, they're the same thing. They're interchangeable. Husband and wife are interchangeable. Mother and father are interchangeable. Uh, and it's reduced everybody to the sameness. But that's not what Scripture tells us. We just heard this passage of St. Paul's. But really, to get a little bit more um, understanding to it, we need to go to one of his other writings, the letter to the Ephesians. And in chapter 5, he says something similar, but he expounds a little bit more. And he says, Christ is the head of the church, so the husband is the head of the wife. So first he's setting it up next to Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. 
Then he says, men, spend yourself for your wife the way Christ did for the church. And if we forget how that is, all we need to do is look at an image for the crucifix. That's how Christ spent his life for his bride, the church. And so this is what men are called to do in their own family life. But this is what we would call one of the hard sayings of the Catholic faith or the hard sayings of the Christian faith. Uh, just like in the scriptures, you may remember when Jesus gives the doctrine of the Eucharist in John chapter 6. For five times he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. And he says it again and again. And then a number of his disciples say, this is a hard saying. Who can accept this? And we're told that a number of his disciples left him that day. Hard sayings are those parts of the scripture or the parts of the word of God that we have to grapple with. And come to, to understand and bring our obedience to it. But first, what, are, what does this look like? Why is this a, a challenge to women? Well, a lot of times when we, in our culture, when we think of authority, we all may have bad memories of authority being abused and it not being something that was served the good. And so there can be some of that, that baggage kind of there. You know, I, I've had, a, when I do marriage prep, sometimes I'll ask, the women all read this passage and then I'll say, are you comfortable with that? Of being under the, of being subordinate or under the mission of your husband or your fiance. And if they say no, I'll say, well, then I don't think you found your husband yet. And I'll say, what? I'll say, well, if you don't trust him enough that you would think that he had anything but your best intentions and anything but the good of your family, uh, then this isn't the man to marry. Wait until you find one that you do trust. But what does this look like as a, a woman? What are the temptations here? Some of the temptations are, one temptation is to, to grumble and complain about the, the father or the husband to your children. To say to your children, don't be like your father. <laughs> Do we often hear that? Don't be like your father. That's undermining his position in the family as the head of the family. It's when uh, the temptation to hold secrets, even small ones. Those small secrets often create a little division into the bond of marriage that can begin to fracture and grow. It's a temptation to, to complain to him or to nag to him and say, you, you need to be a better provider. You need to be holier. You need to be more sensitive. You need to be this or that. Instead of looking for ways to, to praise him when you do see those virtues, to encourage him in the places that he is strong and to keep being supportive in that, that way. So those are some of the ways that that women are tempted in this as a hard saying. Maybe you're saying, well, what's hard about this for men? Well, first, men, what does this authority mean that God has given to you and your family? St. Paul just said it's the same as Jesus Christ to the church. And Jesus Christ to the church is we look to Jesus to set the example. We look to Jesus to take our cues on how we're to live. We look to Jesus to to always be out for our good. Does your family see you in that same way? Would that be how they describe you? Do they take your, their cues from you on how to live the virtuous life? Are they firmly convinced that you're out for their good and you want the best for them? This is a, a heavy authority. It's, a, it's an office that's been entrusted to men. You know, if you've been married, then that is an office given to you. It's not an office you choose whether you want or not. It's part of the vocation. It's part of the mission that God has given to you. And there's a temptation to want to, to push it off at times. And this is true as a priest, too, since a priest stands as a father and a husband to his church. You know, my temptation, and particularly as a pastor, was, you know, there are temptations to want to just take off the collar and tell people not to call me father and let me just be part of you, instead of having to be the one who sets the, the bar and has to be the one who directs things and sets an example and that you take your cues from there's a temptation as a priest to say, I'm going to put all the hard decisions onto the committees so that if something goes wrong, I can blame the committee and say it was their fault, <laughs> right? That's a temptation to a priest, to a pastor. It's a temptation to all men. We want to, at times, undo that burden because if we understand what this authority is, we realize it's a very heavy burden the Lord has placed upon our shoulders. And so what are the temptations the men look like? It's a temptation to shirk the responsibility to make some of the hard decisions. It's a temptation to place 
all that decision making upon the wife, especially in regards to the children. So that if something goes wrong, then you can just blame the wife and not have to take responsibility. It's a temptation to, you know, like with me as a priest, I could take off the collar to tell people that I'm not available. You know, a father can't do that, but there's other ways he can tell people he's not available by just immersing himself in sports on TV or on online activity, video games, just to make it clear that he's not available for conversation. He's not available. It's a temptation to say that the wife is the one who has to take all of the initiative in getting the kids to be religiously brought up, getting them to PSR classes. They're the ones that have to take the initiative to start prayer in a family or to get us to church. It's a temptation to use as an only tool anger, to use that authority. It's a temptation to rely upon anger as that thing that moves rather than through patient work with one's family. And it's a temptation to just want to go back to adolescence, to just be able to be focused on oneself and not have to worry about taking care of others. And then, then your role is also to protect your lives from physical threats from without, but also from emotional threats from within the family. And by that, I mean the respect of your children. It's not a woman's job to instill respect for her and her own kids. That's the father's job. It's the father's duty to make it clear to his children that no disrespect will be accepted in his home for his wife or for their mother, to protect their wife. And then finally, to listen to the counsel of the wife, to recognize that the office of being the head of the house is an office. It's not because you are somehow more superior, have better skills or tools for this. No, it's simply the office has been given to you. It's like me as a pastor. You know, very early on, I learned that I needed to rely upon the council, the parish council, and the finance council and such. I learned that I wasn't normally the holiest person in the room or the smartest person in the room. But at the end of the day, I knew the office was mine and the responsibility was mine for those decisions. And so I had to listen intently to the council and then make the decision. There's a great example of this or a great reminder of this from a, a movie from a few years ago called My Big Fat Greek Wedding, where there's this uh, young Greek woman who's getting married and she has some kind of argument with her father. I can't remember what it was, but then she's she's mad and she says, goes to her mom and she says, Ma, dad's so stubborn. What he says goes. I know the man is the head. And then her mother looks to her and says, Tula. She said, the man is the head. But the wife, she's the neck. And she can move that head wherever she wants to move that head. <laughs> so there's a good image there of, just, of what that role is. And so our are, it's true whether we're talking about us as Jesus's body and he's the head or us as the family and he's the head, or we're talking about a wife and children and the husband is the head. That is not meant to be just passive dependence upon them. That we're meant to be actively engaged in bringing forth the vision of the head as a wife and children, helping the husband to live his vocation and to bring forth his vision which ideally is that if he's living the Christian faith is rooted in this, that he's meant to pour himself out for his family, and he's meant to get them on their way to virtue, <laughs> to holiness, and to goodness. For us as the church, it's to help Christ enact his vision for this world. And we particularly do that through our vocations, through the mission that God has entrusted to us. But that's how we help him get his vision enfleshed in this world. And so on this day of the Feast of the Holy Family, it's good for us to recall that we all have a vocation in, in Christ. We all are meant to be helping him to establish his vision for this world. And we, a good thing to think about today is going back to the very basics of man and woman and what our role in fulfilling that is. And I'd like to recommend a book, uh, both men and to women, uh, to help, you know, we should keep going back to our vocation. If this is our mission in life, we should keep studying about how we live it out fully. You know, priests are meant to keep studying the scriptures and tradition to figure out how to be a better and better priest. And so the same with married couples, to be learning how do I live this out more fully. 
And then particularly all of us as just men and women, how do I live this out more fully? And so there's a great book called Be a Man by Father Larry Richards. So for men called Be a Man by Father Larry Richards. And then a book called The Privilege of Being a Woman by Alice von Hildebrand. The Privilege of Being a Woman by Alice von Hildebrand. And so it's just books and things that help us to, to come to a clearer vision of what our vocation is. And today we have no better example to look to than the Holy Family on this, their teeth. And now let us together stand and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial of the Father. For him all things for me, for us and him for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate in the Virgin Mary, and he came in. For our sake he was crucified and conscious by it. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have with him. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has stood for the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess from baptism for the forgiveness of sin. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world of God. Amen. In God we place our hopes, for he is a sure protector of our families. As we celebrate the Holy Family, let us turn to him in prayer for the needs of all. For the Church, may it follow the example of Mary and Joseph and place its trust completely in God when faced with trials and uncertainties, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For our nation, May we strive to build a society that honors and supports its families. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For families in need of healing, may they learn to love each other more deeply, support each other when troubled, and forgive each other in Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all married couples, may they work to find new ways for their love to grow and show each other heartfelt compassion and patience, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all children, may they see the love their parents have for them and trust in their guidance as they grow into adulthood, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who care for our elderly, may they value them as men and women with inherent dignity and learn from them the wisdom they carry. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. All powerful God, and you all can find strength and support despite the troubles of the world. Give us the help we need to keep our family safe, holy, and unified. We bring our prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Peter and the hand, away and me. Oh, <laughs> 
Lord, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the relation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim, by whose death you will to reconcile us to your Son. Grant that we who are nourished with the body and blood of your Son, and filled with this Holy Spirit, may be called one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make all of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your life, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the blessed Joseph, her spouse, the blessed apostles, and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on his constant intercession in your presence, we rely on daily help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope, and Robert, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, and merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. For our departed brothers and sisters, and all who are pleasing to you for God's sake from this life, give kind of to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever, for and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, sin and save from all distress as we wait the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my room, but only say the word and my soul shall be.
Let us pray. Bring those you refresh with this heavenly sacrament, most merciful Father, to imitate constantly the example of the Holy Family, so that after the trials of this world, we may share their company forever. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God, bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God. Please join us both in heaven. Angels, we have heard our song.